Now, as subject to questions, that's all I want to do, talk about the Bank of Canada, but uh, my, my gracious hosts here have asked me to briefly talk about some of my other cases and how they're separate or how do they fit in with the Bank of Canada case. So if, uh, unless I'm, I'm boring you, I'll take five to seven minutes and I can just briefly talk about uh, uh, the bigger picture, uh, if it's okay with you. All right, so we, uh, Machiavelli once said that, you know, the people, the, the people are, most, are, 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 are most enslaved when they declare themselves to be free, right? That's certainly true. Uh, here in North America, ever since we got our constitution patriated, although there was a, you know, Quebec got screwed in the back rooms, uh, people have declared themselves to be free through a constitution and people just, you know, they've, they've let down their vigilance and people think they're free here. And it's, it's a delusion. It's a complete delusion. Uh, we talk about constitutional democracy. Uh, and the way constitutional democracy is supposed to work is, you know, parliament makes the laws, the government, the executive enforces the laws, obviously, again, you know, they're geared at the citizens and institutions, and the courts, when there's a conflict, are supposed to, you know, resolve uh, uh, those disputes. The courts, believe it or not, and this is a pathetic statement, uh, uh, for some who don't believe in the courts or lawyers, and there's good reason not to believe in the courts and lawyers, the courts are the only thing we have standing between the government, parliament, and the citizen. So the courts decide two things. One, the relationship between the federal and provincial governments and institutions like the Senate and other ins uh, constitutional institutions, and the state and the citizen. You remove the courts, what you have, on a spectrum of benevolence to genocidal is simply a dictatorship. Yeah. Call it what you want, it's a dictatorship. There's no two ways about it. And one of the, one of the really unfortunate aspects of recognizing or describing a dictatorship because of recent 20th century history is we have a tendency to confuse and equate a dictatorship with violence and peace with democracy. The United States of America, despite its problems, was probably the most vibrant democracy in the world in the 20th century, but they were almost also the most pathologically, sociologically violent society on the face of the earth. The two have nothing to do with each other. Canada, or places like some of the Nordic countries were the most peaceful countries in the world, but they're dictatorial. I've been talking about a quiet dictatorship since the Cretan government. For me, it came down with a thump in April 2001 in Quebec City at the summit of the Americas. That was the statement. You fuck off, you live in a dictatorship. Go home or we'll tear gas you, okay? That was it. Uh, There were earlier signs, but because the people who were the victims of the action of the government didn't really get much attention. My Vancouver partners and I, mostly my Vancouver partners, I was in the background, uh, defended the, the First Nations at Gufferson Lake. I don't know, who remembers Gufferson Lake? Very few. Lloyd Axworthy and Princess Diana of Wales were touring the world, trying to convince the world that we should ban landmines, military landmines. Uh, uh, First Nations in northern BC occupied a piece of land they said was stolen from them. The Canadian Army surrounded them and laced the perimeter with the landmines, Princess Diana and Lloyd Axworth, they were trying to ban over Europe at the same frigging time, right? So the dictatorship, and that was all illegal action under the Constitution. Under our constitution, you cannot dispatch military personnel against a civilian, our civilian population. They did the same thing at Oka. That was illegal, completely illegal, contrary to the constitution, okay? So that was the beginnings of our, our in-your-face dictatorship. Since the Chrétien government, we have slid into a quiet, uh, you know, polite dictatorship in typical Canadian fashion. You don't see the genocide, you don't see, but it's there. 
security certificates, indefinite detention without knowing the evidence against you. What is that? You don't need to, you don't need to put 60,000 people in a concentration camp. All you need to do is put five of them for, for indefinitely as a message to the rest of us. Okay? That's the same phenomenon. And so, and so this, this, is, this has been going on for a bit. And, and unfortunately, during this time, the only thing that has saved us from a complete dictatorship is the courts. Under the Harper government, 44 constitutional cases have gone up to the Supreme Court of Canada. The government has lost 43 of them. Okay, so. In the face of this following news flash, of the nine judges of the Supreme Court of Canada, only one was a liberal appointment. The other one was a Monroney appointment, and the other seven have been Harper appointments. So, his own judges are still, so you understand the perceived depth of this undemocratic government. I am not partisan. I, don't, I, I sued Chrétien governments more times than I have Harper's government. A lot of people misunderstand my cases in terms of personalizing them to me. It's not, I don't care which government it is. It's, it's it, all governments, all, you know, we have political parties that just have different football jersey colors, you know? I mean, there's not much of a spectrum, right? We got, we got, you know, so we got, we got, we, we, we got, uh, we got uh, orange, we got uh, red, and we have le bleu, not to be confused with Quebecois bleu, but, you know, we got the conservatives, so that's it. So it doesn't matter to me which government it is, if they, they act unconstitutionally, they, they have to be uh, made to account. Uh, Now, the reason I say, unfortunately, the courts are the only, uh, and I'll finish with this, uh, it's because it's not that, it's not that, that you know, they don't try hard or they, you know, uh, we shouldn't access them. Certainly, I access them because they need to be accessed. They're not the complete and only and best venue for, uh, for socioeconomic change. As I said before, they're a blunt instrument. They can only do certain things. They can certainly, like in this case, act as an, a, a lightning rod to publicize certain issues that people may not be aware of, uh, but they cannot do what needs to be done on a broader scale. Second of all, cases going to the Supreme Court of Canada are, are extremely expensive. Uh, it's a good thing you're sitting down. The average case Okay, the average case, and my dear client can attest to they're not being charged this, but uh, the average case to go to the Supreme Court of Canada is 1.2 to $2 million from the ground up, okay? Now, there's no way they're paying me that for this, but uh, how many people have that kind of money to go to the Supreme Court, right? The 1%. The 1 that's why you see, that's right. That's why... That's why you, <coughs> and so the other cases depend on the goodwill pro bono services of lawyers, if they know how to take the case up. 